Okay, now we're gonna move on to our epigastrum. Now in our epigastrum, you have to think about really three conditions. The first is peptic ulcer disease, duodenal ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease basically says gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer. Pancreatitis and aortic dissection. Now we're gonna get to aortic dissection later on when we get to vascular surgical interventions. It will occur right after we do ortho. And pancreatitis, we're gonna do as soon as we start talking about the right upper quadrant because what's the most common cause of pancreatitis? Most well, alcohol and gallstones. So we need to focus in on peptic ulcer disease. Now peptic ulcer disease, oh, well first of all, how are the patients gonna present and what causes it? Patients are going to complain of gnawing, deep, boring, epigastric pain. If it's gastric, it's gonna be worsened with eating. If it's duodenal, it's gonna get better with eating. They may have blood in their stool. They may notice that they're actually having anorexia because they're afraid to eat if it's a gastric ulcer. There are only three causes of ulcers in the United States. And ladies and gentlemen, there are only three causes of ulcers in China. There are only three causes of ulcer in the world. All of you get this a bit confused, and so we're gonna clear up the confusion right now. Peptic ulcers are only caused by three things. First, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug abuse, meaning too much ibuprofen, too much naproxen. They actually cause a lack of prostaglandins. Those prostaglandins actually are important because they help maintain your stomach lining. Second cause, that infection. Oh yes, you know it. Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is the second cause of ulcers. And the third cause of ulcers in the whole world is going to be cancer. Those are the only three things that can actually cause you to have an ulcer develop in your body. All the other things that you're thinking about, alcohol, smoking, cocaine, certain medications, etc., 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 all delay the healing of ulcers or cause gastritis. Gastritis is very different than an ulcer. Gastritis is inflammation of the lining. Ulcers is a break in the lining that bleeds. Very different thing. Now you know how they're going to present and how it's caused and what's causing it. Well, how do you diagnose it? An ulcer is a mucosal disease. Gastroenterologists only have one test to look at your mucosa. That is an endoscopy. An esophageal gastroduodenoscopy will look at your esophagus, will look at your stomach, and the first two portions of your duodenum. It will then identify the actual ulcer. Gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers are very dangerous. Duodenal ulcers specifically because you have to worry about them continuing to get worse and perforate, so they need a second look to make sure they're healing. Gastric ulcers are very, very scary because you have to worry about the fact that they may be malignant, so they need to be biopsied. Biopsies will also tell you if the patient's H. pylori positive. If they are H. pylori positive, you treat them as indicated. So for example, there's COP therapy, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be cap therapy, clarithromycin amoxicillin PPI. If that doesn't work, you can then switch them over to quadruple therapy where you add on bismuth. If they're penicillin allergic, you can use metronidazole. But you're going to treat the H. pylori and then you're gonna look for eradication of the actual H. pylori. Now how do you test for eradication? Well, in the United States we have several ways. The most common wrong answer on your exam is to say check for serology, it means look for the antibody in the blood. Ladies and gentlemen, remember IgG antibodies, you keep those for life. So you can't check an IgG, it's always gonna be positive. So the way you check it is either by stool antigen testing or breath testing. Now if you ask a thousand Americans, would you rather drink some radioactive carbon, breathe into a bag, and that'll tell you within two hours if H. pylori is still there, or would you like to give us a stool sample by yourself at home where you have to touch your poo poo, which one do you think they chose? It actually turns out we are a very vain population. Something close to like 980 of them said, I'm not touching my own poop. I would rather take the radioactive carbon. Now mind you, it's not really radioactive carbon, it's just carbon that's tagged, carbon 13, carbon 14, and you drink it and then it eventually makes its way back out into your breath. If it's positive, it tells you you still have H. pylori. Those are the two ways to check for eradication. However, the gold standard testing is biopsy. Now, H. pylori is a risk factor for two conditions. The first is going to be adenocarcinoma. The second is malt lymphoma or a B-cell lymphoma. Both of these conditions, H. pylori is a known risk factor. There are patients who can have both of them within the same stomach as well. In the case of a malt lymphoma, which is a lymphoma of the marginal cells in your stomach, if you treat the H. pylori, the lymphoma goes away. However, if you treat the H. pylori, you go back in, you take a look, and the lymphoma does not go away, 
You then have to check for a specific translocation 1118 in this tissue specimen, and that confers a specific form of resistance. Those patients will require a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and possibly surgery. Now, once you've taken care of the H. pylori, let's say that wasn't even an issue. What if they're just abusing NSAIDs? Well, very straightforward. Stop taking NSAIDs, you put the patient on a proton pump inhibitor, and the stomach will heal over time. The patient comes in and they say to you, well, I have had a history of gastric bleeding from an ulcer, but I need to be put on aspirin for primary prevention for my heart. What do you tell them? Do you tell them no aspirin? You have a history of GI bleeding? Or go ahead and start aspirin, but maintain therapy with the PPI. The answer is, heart comes first, you treat them with a PPI concurrently. Next question I'd like to ask you on the boards is, well, what do I do about my actual PPI? Do I have to take it for life? The answer is no. You don't need to take a PPI for life. If they have gastric ulcer, peptic ulcer, once their symptoms have gone away and we know that we've eradicated the underlying cause, you're actually going to taper off the PPI. Remember, when you're on a PPI, your gastric acid levels are going to be outputting low. What that means is you're going to have a lack of negative feedback, so your gastrin levels are going to be high. So if you stop the PPI, all of a sudden that excessively high gastrin level is going to promote a high acid output and the patients are going to become very symptomatic very soon. By tapering the PPI, you can actually lower that gastrin level safely to sort of eliminate that rebound hypergastrinemia. So that's peptic ulcer disease in the form of gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer. In the GI section, remember we go into a great deal more detail. The beautiful thing about our course with MedQuest is you can pause, go back to that, and come back to me whenever you want. Now, we're moving on to our right upper quadrant with the story of the stone, so let's get started.